How was that for a great start for the first day of the Humans to Mars Summit for 2019? That, of course, was John Logston uh, moderating that last panel. Uh, he will join me here during the break in just a couple of minutes after we uh, look at uh, that video again from the gold sponsor of uh, Humans to Mars, uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne. I'm Matt Kaplan of the Planetary Society. Again, it's my pleasure to host the webcast. But I also will be on stage right after this break because my panel uh, is up next. In only about 15 or 20 minutes, we're going to be talking about the InSight mission, the most recent arrival at Mars. Let's go ahead and look at that video from Aerojet Rocketdyne, again, gold sponsor of the 2019 Humans to Mars Summit, brought to you by Explore Mars. After seven decades of exploring our solar system, Aerojet Rocketdyne is now embarking on its next great space endeavor, sending humans back to the moon and creating a deep space gateway. This lunar outpost will provide explorers a safe place to live and work while preparing for the long haul to Mars. Our power and propulsion elements will play a central role in the orbital maneuvering and station keeping, life support, and other essential electrical components on the deep space gateway. When the Space Launch System makes its climb into space, it will be powered by four RS-25 booster engines. Once the rocket has safely reached space, our jettison motor pulls the launch abort system away from the rocket. Four RL-10 engines on the upper stage will then take over to propel the crew toward their destination. The Orion spacecraft's reaction control system, along with the European Service Module's OMS engine and auxiliary engines, will provide trajectory correction maneuvers. After eight out of eight successfully landed robotic missions on Mars and five orbiters circling the red planet, humans will soon be joining them. Sending habitats and cargo to Mars with electric propulsion ahead of the crew will enable shorter travel time and shorter setup time on planet. Additionally, we are working on nuclear thermal propulsion to quickly transport astronaut crews to deep space and safely back to Earth. The SLS rocket will also allow in-depth exploration of potential life-bearing worlds such as Europa. This extensive suite of propulsion will be responsible for opening this new chapter in space exploration, science, and discovery, and may one day reveal the answer to, are we alone in the universe? We're ready for the next giant leap in space exploration. Welcome back. That was a video from Aerojet Rocketdyne, the uh, gold sponsor for the 2019 Humans to Mars Summit, which is well underway now on the very first day of three coming to you from this beautiful auditorium at the even more beautiful National Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C. I'm Matt Kaplan of the Planetary Society. Turning now to uh, the man who moderated that last panel, a board member of the Planetary Society, but also founder of the Space Policy Institute at George Washington University. And uh, I've got him here, the author of books including John F. Kennedy and the Race to the Moon, and After Apollo, and another book I think that's coming up Maybe we'll get to that in a moment. It's out already, Ronald Reagan and the Space Frontier. That's right. I saw it for sale. Yes. Yeah. So continuing that series, but we'll talk about that in a moment, John. But for now, you had a terrific panel up there. And my goodness, what timing following the NASA Administrator, Jim Bridenstine, following his big announcement last night. It was all planned, of course. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody could pull it off, it would be you, I'm sure. Um, uh, what do you think? of what we heard last night and what the administrator very enthusiastically was endorsing on stage here just a, uh, about an hour ago. Uh, we're talking about footsteps on the moon again by 2024, asking for an augmentation of the NASA budget of about 1.6 billion, which is about what it takes to get a rover to Mars. I mean, can this be done? Well, we'll see. Uh, I think it, it does no good to be pessimistic. Uh, 
uh, uh, Jim Bridenstine said that that 1.6 was at the low end of the money needed. So, you know, we're, we're, we're starting a little bit behind the curve uh, in terms of, of resources available. And, and frankly, I'd like to see what the run out numbers for the next four or five years are, uh, whether there will be adequate resources, whether the Trump administration will uh, uh, walk the walk as, as much as they have uh, talk the talk, talk the talk, uh, you know, I mean, the rhetoric, great. The words are great. Let's see. And but 1.6 billion is not chump change. Yeah, but it's also not, you know, 10 or 15 billion, which would not have been a terrible surprise if they had said, this is what we need to get to the moon. Well, it may well be 10 or 15 billion over the next four years. I mean, you've got to weigh what Congress can swallow, uh, the other demands on the budget, what NASA can actually use. Uh, if you gave NASA $8 billion next year, could they do anything productive with it? Uh, you know, there's a lot of organizational churning that will be required to get ready and aligned to do this. What do you think of the discussion? And I'm not sure if this is a part of what is being proposed as part of this amended or supplemental budget, but there was discussion of something that's been talked about many times, and I think you know the only other time it was achieved, and that is a multi-year budget. Instead of NASA having to go back every year or two, being given the money up front uh, and, and told, go and do this, here's everything you need over the next, what, five years? Well, that's clearly not happening uh, because the uh, administration announced a one year plus up uh, last night. So uh, uh, however desirable a multi-year budget might be, and of course it's nice if you know what you've got, uh, uh, if, if what you've got is adequate. Uh, I think the political climate and this, this rapid acceleration of the program, this may be all that the system can bear, the political system, not the technical system. So we've been here before. SEI under George H.W. Bush. Uh, Constellation under George W. Bush. The policy and political challenges seem to be much greater than the technical ones. I think you said as much on stage. Indeed. Uh, I mean, in 1989, George H.W. Bush said, back to the moon, it's time to stay, then on to Mars. Sounds a little familiar, right? Uh, uh, but it was a Democratic-controlled Congress, both houses then. Here we have a Democratic-controlled House. We'll see whether they're willing to sign on. In 1989, they were not. Plus, NASA didn't want the job. NASA was uh, fully occupied, they thought, with getting the shuttle back flying and the, uh, developing the space station. So they put forward a kind of ridiculous cost estimate uh, that caused the initiative to be stillborn. Uh, in 04, with the vision for space exploration, the George W. Bush administration never requested the money they did not walk the walk, as it, as it were. So uh, Mr. Uh, Bush, after the uh, Columbia accident, wanted something dramatic to announce, but I don't think his heart was in it. Uh, and certainly his money wasn't in it. <laughs> and I'll mention a little plug here. The current uh, uh, Space Policy Edition of Planetary Radio actually has a very good conversation by my colleague Casey Dreyer about the Space Exploration Initiative Indeed. under H.W. Bush. Uh, we've only got a minute left. Tell us about the new book, picking up this, it's kind of a trilogy now, right? On right. to Reagan. On to Reagan, and I think it's the last one I'm gonna do. I'm getting old. Uh, so I, I look at Kennedy, I look at Nixon, I look at Reagan, and their impact on the space program. Reagan had some good impacts, but he certainly did not increase the budget. His rhetoric was like Kennedy, his decisions were like Nixon. <laughs> I hope we learn from history, John. One, that's why I try to do it. <laughs> Thank you, John. Welcome. Good to see you. You too. John Logston, founder of the Space Policy Institute at George Washington University and author of the books that you just heard about, a regular uh, guest of mine on Planetary Radio as well. Uh, I do have the panel that's coming up next. We are in the midst of a break here at the 2019 Humans to Mars Summit. But yeah, we I do want coffee. Oh. <laughs> and, and John wants coffee. You can go get your coffee. Go get a snack, too. You've earned it. Okay. Thanks, Matt. You bet. Um, we are going to uh, bring you some very special videos now. You may have heard of Project Mars. It was a competition uh, to develop posters and also films, videos, to um, complement 
our interest in returning or getting humans to Mars, which is what we're all about today. And so we have a whole series of this these films that we'll be playing back during these breaks over the next three days. And we're going to go to one of those Project Mars videos right now. <laughs> 